We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. thank the uh, organizers for inviting me um, and for providing this incredible opportunity for all of us to, to be together and to imagine. It is the human capacity to move between the worlds of what is and what could be that marks the emergence of a particular evolutionary context and history for the genus Homo, us, humans. I argue that it's the human capacity to imagine, to be creative, to hope and to dream, to infuse the world with meanings and to cast our aspirations far and wide, limited neither by personal experience nor material reality that has enabled our lineage, the genus Homo, to develop a particular niche, a particular way of being in the world where imagination plays a central role. Humans are very creative and we use our imagination to be so. This has an evolutionary history. The real challenge uh, to understanding human evolution then is not just the tracing of the bones and stones of the 2.6 million year history of our genus. Instead, it is understanding those changes alongside the reality that our lineage is a lineage that went from the makers of basic stone tools to the creators of amazing cave art to the constructors, constructors of massive cities and the dominant force shaping the ecosystem today. Our lineages transition from a cluster of medium-sized, medium fangless, hornless, clawless, semi-naked or fully naked, ape-like things with a few rocks and some sticks to a species who invented domestication, economies, cities, nations, religion, warfare, and peace. That is the challenge of understanding human evolution. Now, let me put humans in context here before you think I am talking only about human exceptionalism. That is, we know that there are many other species that use tools, that have incredibly complex social lives, that use sound as communication traveling across incredible distance, and that have cultural varieties that actually impact the way in which their genomes shift. Here's uh, an example of hunting patterns across uh, latitudinal variation in orca pods that has actually had a huge change in their structure of their genomes. So gene culture coevolution doesn't just occur in humans, it occurs in many organisms. However, we have studied other complex organisms like chimpanzees and whales and orcas for a long time, and we know a lot about what they do and what they don't do. We know that chimpanzees don't have cash economies, governments, religious institutions, creeds, or fanatics. They don't arrest and deport each other, and they don't create massive economies of material and social inequality. They don't change planet-wide ecosystems, build cities, make airplanes, drive thousands of other species to extinction, or give carta talks. <laughs> but we do. We are a particular mammal, a particular primate, and a particular hominoid kind of ape that is able to look at the world around us and see it as it is, imagine entirely new possibilities, and convert those imaginings into material reality. We have evolved the capacity to be the most compassionate, the cruelest, the most creative, and the most destructive of all life on this planet. And we demonstrate these abilities often. How this difference came to be matters. And it is by delving into humanity's very distinctive history 
that we are able to understand why we are the way we are. There's incredibly good evidence that over the last two million years, the members of the genus Homo, all of those things that have something to do with our specific ancestry, underwent significant changes in their brains, their bodies, their behavior, and they created a new niche, a new way of existing, both ecologically and socially in the world. This is a human niche, and this niche involves a particular evolution of something called a human imagination. Human imagination, I would like to argue, is as important as the bones and stones in understanding the processes and patterns of human evolution. All right, here is a summary of a whole bunch of interesting things that have happened over the last two million years to our lineage. What I want to point out here, and I'll provide some specific examples, is that this is not just about linear, even though it's a line, uh, linear evolution. This is about the changing relation between individuals, between individuals in the material world, between individuals in the material world and their cognitive interpretation of that material world, and that cycle getting more and more dense. As we changed, as we changed the world around us, as we changed one another, we began an intricate dance which is culminating uh, today and hopefully will continue into the future. So rather than talk about this shifting in crania or other morphologies, let's spend a little time with a few of the pieces of evidence we have of our evolutionary history that talk about this incredible dynamic, this feedback between the material, the social, the cognitive, and our evolutionary histories. So we know that significant dietary changes happened uh, fairly early on in our history, um, but those significant dietary uh, uh, changes enabled, for example, our brains to get much larger and a variety of other things. However, we sometimes forget that those significant dietary changes are really associated with the use of tools. Now, um, I'm gonna show you uh, some tools here. Um, this is a, up here in the uh, upper, your upper, left corner. Uh, this is an old one tool. It's about 1.8 million years old. I'm sure none of you are impressed. It is a rock with some sharp edges. But you should be. Nothing else in the history of this planet, aside from our lineage, has ever had the capacity to take a stone, to look at that stone, and to imagine something else inside that stone, to take another object and work it on that initial stone to create something anew from inside. That's fairly impressive. And we know how difficult some of these processes are. If you look at the uh, next illustration here, um, you will notice that this is actually a reconstruction of all of the napping of a stone tool, right? So what we actually do is you go in and you get the detritus, the debris, and you piece it back together so you can look at every single strike. Now when I say we, I mean the graduate students that actually do the work, not the professors. <laughs> But what you then know is you can see that the individual stone tool maker, even for these fairly old, old stone tools, here uh, we're getting into the Acheulean stone tool industry, looking something a bit more like this. What we can see is that you take it, you have the platform, you look at it, you strike it, you've totally radically altered the whole shape. You now have to reimagine the entire thing, hit it in the next place, hit it in the next place. And when we construct those together, it is unbelievably difficult. It takes a student today months to learn how to be a good stone tool maker. And that is with video training, right? With the rocks already brought to you and without any large predators trying to eat you while you do your work. <laughs> we can underestimate how important this was. Think about what I just said. Not all stones are equally good for making stone tools. So to make stone tools, even the most basic ones, you have to be able to find decent stones and replicate that finding. You have to go back and get them again and again. Then you have to carry, I don't know how many of you carry regularly 20 or 30 kilos of stones with you, but that's a lot of work. Dispersing that socially is very important. Then you have to make stone tools in an environment that is packed with very large things with large teeth that want to eat you. And remember, you're very small, naked, and you've got some rocks and some few sticks. When you make stone tools, it makes a lot of noise. So you've got everything sort of stacked against you. How did our ancestors figure this out? How did they work through it? Imagination, collaboration, cooperation, really focusing in on the social. But really interestingly, current work looking at what it means to make stone tools uh, by Dietrich Stout and, and a number of other groups have demonstrated that when you make these stone tools, certain areas of neuro neurobiological activity are accentuated and there's some corollary patterns. 
Now, what are these areas? And frequently, these are areas associated with uh, uh, higher functioning in memory, with uh, planning, and interestingly enough, with language. But wait, don't order yet, because it's not just the Making Stone tools that does these things in your brain, which probably means they have a deep ancestry for doing that. But also, if you are watching a stone tool maker, you mirror some of those functions. And here is the critical component of stone tools. It's not about the tools themselves. It's about the social context in which they were made and used. We can debate whether or not teaching occurred 1.5 million years ago. What we can't debate is these complex stone tools were made at 1.5, 1 million, 500,000 years ago that you or I could not make without being instructed. Was there language? I don't think so. But there was a broad bandwidth of highly dense information transfer that was social and that was imaginative. Now, around this time period, and between about 1.5 and a million years ago, as I pointed out, that niche is constantly sort of augmenting as more ways of dealing with the world occur, that density and those feedbacks continue to shape our bodies, our lives, our cognition. We know that by about half a million years ago, you know, give or take 50,000 years, I like to work in big numbers, we had an incredible capacity to collaborate in ways that seemed to exceed the collaboration of many other organisms. We had an incredibly complex cooperative parenting where males and young were also caring for offspring. We had a pattern of the whole communities responding to environmental pressures, not just individuals. And we had evidence of augmentation and enhancement in our imaginative capabilities. For example, and we'll hear more about this later today, fire. Uh, we heard about it already in the previous talk. People underestimate fire all the time. Yes, fire is wonderful because it allows us to access to nutrients that we wouldn't have otherwise by heating food. It also allows us to modify stones and wood to alter their, their physical structures so that we can better use them. But more importantly, as is already mentioned, fire turns night to day. Fire releases us from the constraint of the sun. Fire enables an expansion of the time we have to be together, to think together, to imagine together. But it's not just evidence of fire, which maybe goes as far back as 1.6 million years ago. We have glimmerings, elements, but it really is until about four or 500,000 years ago, 300,000 years ago that we start to see it with increasing regularity. But it's not just fire and really, from my perspective, cool stone tools. Here's a nearly 300,000-year-old clamshell from Java that at some point, something in the lineage homo picked up, grabbed another object, and doodled on it. Most people, just like that early old one stone tool I showed you, are not impressed by doodles. But you should be. Think what it means to doodle. Think what it means to take an object, to take another object, and to alter the surface to create a new sensation. We see this. Over the last 300, 400,000 years, we see glimmerings earlier, but it's really over this last three to 400,000 years that we start to see this which much higher density. At that same time period, we also have two very interesting, okay, not very many, but two very interesting events. Here at Atapuerca, about 400,000 years ago, we have a number of bodies found in one place, a deep pit. In that deep pit are a couple cave bears that look like they fell in and a bunch of other things that have been gnawing on the bones but nothing else except for, as you can see here, this beautiful hand axe, it's about this big. It's made from a stone that is not local, um, and it is gorgeous. It was carved and thrown in, never used. What does that mean? We won't ever know, but I bet it had something to do with the imagination and the creativity and meaning for that group of people. And more recently, about, say, between 200 and 300,000 years ago, we have another evidence of possible movement of bodies into an underground cave. People debate whether it's burial or not. I don't want to get into that debate, but I do want to point out that we have glimmerings earlier on, but all of these things, burials, art, creative imaginings, incredible manipulation of the world, all has a deep evolutionary history and didn't just show up when our species shows up, because everything I've just showed you predates Homo sapiens sapiens. 
But by uh, the last 30, 50,000 years or so, we find clear examples of identity, clear examples of individuals taking items, reshaping them to create a completely new reality, a new imagination, a new way to be in the world. And it is my and many others' arguments that this new way to be in the world, these new senses of identity, this new deployment of imagination had a huge impact on those feedback loops between our ecology, between the materials, between our bodies, between our cognition, and between our societies. So the human niche is, of course, centrally located and focused. Our studies of understanding human evolution has to be about our brain and our DNA and our morphology and our bodies, but it also has to be about all of the different ecologies that humans have spread across the entire planet. So it's our brains, our bodies, our ecologies, and, and you already all know this, our perceptual realities, the way we see the world, the way we think about the world, the way we feel the world is as important as our bones, our muscles, and our DNA, because part of that system, that feedback, that complex dynamic that is the human involves the imagination. So the human niche includes creativity, cooperation, and imagination. Meaning, especially making meaning, matters as an agent in the processes of our evolutionary histories. It is specifically feedback system between behaviors, ecologies, cognitive and bodily systems involved in teaching and learning and meaning making, communicating, that facilitated a new niche that had huge impacts. For example, it set up our brains, it structured them in a way that uh, Michael Arbib calls language ready, right? You don't just get language, it has to evolve and the cognitive and neurobiological structures have to be there. And part of that is this. We also have communities of shared imagination. Seeing these multiple iterative events of meaning making across space and time shows that communities of humans, and I'm using the term broadly because I don't necessarily just mean homo sapiens, were capable of working together to remake the world in their and from their imagination. So meaning making, imagination, communication, creativity, and community are central. That's my pitch. However, all of this stuff sounds very positive and really, really exciting. I would like to say that our capacity to be with one another, to share our minds, to imagine, to think forward as a central part of our evolutionary niche also brings with it a few problems. Imagination made humans exceptional, but also potentially extremely dangerous. We have interconnected the world in a way that nothing on this planet has ever done. And through that interconnection, we are reshaping what the world actually looks like. Here's a global human density map. This is a better map than most that you look at because this is the way we're shaping the actual surface and functioning of the earth. We have imagined ourselves into a position where it is in the balance. Our ecologies, our capacities, our creativities are nearing or bringing us to the point where decisions have to be made and have to be imagined. We know today, for example, in the United States, we have systems of racism, misogyny, and inequality unknown before. So we need to understand how our imagination and creativity has gotten us to this state, always remembering that in fact, that imagination and creativity is the one thing that can get us out of it. Being together with one another, thinking together, creating, imagining, seeing the world as the way it is, imagining other possibilities, and at least trying to make them happen. That's what got humans to where we are today. Thank you.